I want you to know the feelings of your pastor, the sentiments and so on that he has expressed concerning our friendship and relationship. They are mutual. I feel the same way. I am. Um, he's the only pastor I trust to do my radio program when I'm on vacation. Or when I can't do it, so do those of you who listen, who get the opportunity to listen, I would realize I, I would usually have him fitting, fitting in for me. And the last couple of years, it has been quite frequent. And um, once he's available, he always seizes the opportunity. And I, I tell you, you really have a gift from God in the person of your past. And all the Bible says we are gifts to the body of Christ, gifts to the church. But I want to say to you, you have a gift in the person of your pastor. Amen. I, it's a good time to give the Lord a hand of appreciation. Amen. You know, because um, there are very few pastors. And when I say few, I really mean few. Pastors I could relate to in the way I relate to your pastor. I, you know, this commitment to the word of God, song, doctrine, and, and standards, and holiness, and all of that. But uh, to, just to give you an idea of, 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 of um, the quality of this gift you have in the person of your pastor, um, whenever he's on my program, we get more calls about his messages and his preaching than mine. <laughs> but that's okay. I feel honored that I can have him fit in for me. I say, all right, once, once people are listening, I don't mind because I know they will listen to the following. They don't know when he's coming on, so they'll hear me. <laughs> when I told my wife what the Lord laid on my heart to share with you, I'll be honest with you. She said, that? <laughs> and the reason why she, she responded that way is that she knows your pastor. And she knows, you know, uh, what he stands for. And, you know, you hear a lot of, uh, you hear certain things coming through many times in his messages. So she said, those people will be familiar. I said, well, this is what the Lord gave me. So uh, what I want to say, I'll maybe I want to believe a lot of what I'm saying, you already know. Um, you have heard it many times through your pastor, but maybe the Lord wants to say it in a way that maybe it didn't connect with you before. It didn't. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. But this is what he gave me. So it's going to be, I want to say, simple, straightforward, sobering, um, hopefully short and sweet. <laughs> right? 5S. Could you turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2? 1 John chapter 2. And when you're found, it's Amen. First John chapter 2. We'll be actually going right over into chapter 3. Okay, everybody found it? Okay, good. I like it when I see people open their Bibles. I always tell our congregation, you know, your cell phone could be stolen, your tablet could be stolen. You hardly see a thief breaking into a house and stealing this. <laughs> So I like, to, I like to stick with this. <laughs> the hard copy, as they would say. Amen? Let us just stand for a brief word of prayer. Father, we just thank you for all of your love, your mercy, and grace. We thank you for your mercies, which are new every morning. And we declare, according to your word, great is your faithfulness. And Lord, you said, faithful is he who called you, who will also do it. And we thank you for your faithfulness that has kept us thus far in our faith and walk with you and your faithfulness that has allowed us to be here this morning. And dear Father, um, I pray, O oh God, once more that you will touch my mind and touch my lips so that this word that you have given me to deliver, Father, will go forth in the power of your spirit. It will be energized and quickened by your spirit to accomplish that which you please and prosper in the purposes for which you are sending it forth. Even now, in the name of Jesus, in the authority of the name of Jesus, I sprinkle by faith the blood of Jesus over the atmosphere 
and declare free course for the word of God. And I declare now that the good, acceptable, and perfect will be done. And the, and the name of Jesus Christ be glorified in all things. In whose name we pray thanksgiving. And every saint in this house say, Amen. You may have your seats. This morning we are looking at 1 John chapter 2 from verse 28 going into chapter 3 and verse 3. It states there, and I read to you from the New King James Version, And now, little children, abide in him, that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed at his coming. Note those words, and not be ashamed at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now are we the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, and that is when he appears and returns for us, we shall be like him. Say that, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And notice what verse 3 says. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So this message is entitled, uh, A Call to Purity. A Call to Purity. Now, as we peruse the scriptures, one of the things we cannot help but notice is that throughout the ages, there is a call of God to all of his people that remains constant and unchanging. It's the call to purity, the call to purity of life, the call to a life of separation unto God, and consecration unto holiness. And it will only take a few, just a few select verses of scripture to confirm and affirm this call. For example, in Psalm 24, verses 3 and the first portion of 4, we would see where there are two questions and then the answer. Who shall ascend into the hell of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath, that's the answer, he that hath clean hands, and what? A pure heart. In Psalm 73 and verse 1, the psalmist declared, Truly God is good to Israel and to such as are pure in heart. In 2 Samuel 22, Verse 7, the first portion there, and Psalm 18, verse 26, the first portion there. You will see where the psalmist declared, to the pure, say pure. You will show yourself pure. Then we have the words of the master himself in what is called the Sermon on the Mount. When he said in Matthew's Gospel 5 and verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart. Say blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see God. You see? Then in 1 Timothy uh, 4 and uh, verse 12, we would see where Timothy was exhorted by the Apostle Paul, Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, and the old version say it in conversation, but it means conduct or lifestyle. Okay? It means conduct or lifestyle. So in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Look, that word again keeps coming up. It keeps popping up over and over. Purity, purity, purity. The call is there. Then in verse 22 of chapter 5 in the same epistle, you would see where Paul again exhorted, do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share or partake. Don't, don't, don't be participating in other people's sins. But you know what you must do? Keep yourself pure. Keep yourself pure. And um, then we have 2 Timothy 2 and verse 22. It states there, 
Flee also youthful lust. Notice in the previous chapter, there was a call to the youth. And there's a call to the youth here. And why? Because um, let's be real. Let's be honest. There's a lot of hormone, hormonal surges and urges during our youthful days. And, and if they are not under the control of the Holy Spirit, it could lead us into the right direction. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You see? See, there's always a battle. The young people have it much more greater than those who are a bit more up in age and married and settled down and so on. Uh, but by the way, remember the Apostle Paul said, have no confidence in the flesh, eh? <laughs> right? As long as you're in this thing. <laughs> Don't ever take your walk with God for granted. But Paul says, flee youthful lust, pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, with all those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So we see these repeated calls, confirming and, aff and affirming the call to purity. In our text for today's message, we will see again a call to purity, a call to purity of life, a call to separation unto God and consecration unto holiness. And now as we look at this call to purity, I want us to note three characteristics of this call. Three characteristics of this call. First, I want you to note it's an urgent call. An urgent call. Yes. Tell your neighbor it's an urgent call. It's a call that requires immediate action and attention. This is so because it's a call that's made in the light of the Lord's imminent return. We are speaking of the Lord's return at any moment for his bride, the church, those who are his people who are the called out and called by his name. There's somebody here in Mendes house. You see, this was the expectation and motivation for this spirit-inspired call by the Apostle John. Let's look at our text again in chapter 2 and verse 28. Look what it says there. And now little children abide in him that when he appears, when he returns for us, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. In the original Greek, ashamed also means shrink back. So it suggests that if believers are not careful, they will not feel exactly comfortable at the thought of being in the presence of the Lord with hands that are not clean or a heart that is not pure. Is somebody understanding me today? Notice also Verses 2 and 3 in the following chapter. Beloved, now are we the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. In other words, what we shall be like. But we know that when he is revealed, when he, when he appears and returns for us, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him, in other words, this hope of seeing him, being ready and prepared for when he comes, so you actually behold him. What must he do? Purify himself. I see himself as pure. It's an ongoing work. By the enabling grace and power of the Holy Spirit. And one of the things I'm thankful to God for, even though at times the battle seems so unfair <laughs> and so requiring so much effort and determination on our part, is this. The previous verse, verse 2, where it says, we shall be like him. If we connect that to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I believe it is verses 51 and 52, we would see, when he comes, we shall be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. And this corruptible shall put on in corruption. And this mortal shall put on immortality. Now, what this really means, 
um, from my, in my understanding, that, 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 that really encourages my heart. There's coming a day. I wouldn't ever have to battle any kinds of unclean thoughts. Any kind of corrupt thoughts. Because I could tell you could be in the holiest place. In the highest realms of the heavenlies in worship. And just out of the blue like that. If you're not, the devil starts bombarding your mind. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And you're wondering what's wrong with you. You're in the house of God. You're worshiping God. Where are these things coming from? I'm thankful to God. One of these days we shall be like him. We will never ever be tempted by sin again. We'll be, right now we are saved from the, 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 power, um, the penalty of sin. And the power of sin, but one day we'll be saved from the very presence of sin. Give the Lord a hand of praise in the house of God, somebody. And we shall be like him. We'll never have to go before God again and to confess any sin and to ask his forgiveness. Hallelujah. We shall be saved and saved forevermore, body, soul, and spirit. Give the Lord another hand of praise in the house of God. But the apostle John just as the rest of the apostles and the church back then, they expected the Lord's return back in their lifetime. They was expecting before they closed their eyes. They didn't expect 2,000 years, 2,000 plus 17 years afterwards, the Lord didn't return as yet. But you know what? I want us to understand we are closer now to the coming of the Lord than back then. Because today we are seeing the fulfillment of end time prophecy uh, with increasing frequency and intensity. How many of you understand what I'm trying? And I know your pastor always talked to you about those things, about end times and all of that. We are seeing it. Like my wife and I had a, a, a conversation here and we were saying, you know, if these are not the last days, there ain't no last days. This got to be it. This got to be the terminal generation. This got to be the generation in which Jesus Christ returned. I turned 60 last year and I believe, before I close my eyes, before I kick the bucket, in my lifetime, while I'm still alive, Jesus Christ is going to return. Yes, I still have some plans. I believe the Lord is going to bless me with uh, the three score and ten, and I asked him for a bonus seven, and when I reached get that bonus seven, I'll ask him for another bonus seven. But I want to say this. I am seeking to live my life by the grace and power of the Lord, that at any moment in time in which he returns, I'm ready. And the thing we all got to do to make sure we are ready, because it's an urgent call, in the light of his imminent return, is to keep yourself pure. In Titus 2, 11 verses uh, to 14, we are told, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us, look what it teaches us, and trains us to deny all ungodliness and worldly lusts. So don't be conformed to this world. Don't go with the flow with the world. We should live soberly, so keep your head on. Righteously live right. And godly, a life that conforms to godly principles as revealed in the word of God. Looking for the blessed hope. The glorious appearing of our great God. The glorious return of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And notice why we should do it. He loved us. He loved us and gave himself us that he, might, uh, 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 that he might redeem us, deliver us, set us free from all iniquity, from every lawless deed, from, 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 from the sin that dominates and controls us before we came to faith in Christ, that controls and dominates the lives of those outside of Christ. All iniquity. And that he might purify, say purify. There is the word again in the light of the Lord's coming. Purity, purify for himself a peculiar people, his own special people. That is what it, it doesn't mean we are weird. Maybe to the world we might appear weird because we, we choose to live different according to the word of God. But it really means a people for his own possession, his own special people. You need to understand that you, you are somebody special because of the blood of Jesus Christ that has redeemed you, delivered you, and set you free. Give the Lord a hand of praise. He has redeemed you. To be his own special people who are zealous for God's works. And to live in a way that honors and glorifies him. I just want to say in passing because I don't want to make a message out of this. But when I consider the billions of people upon this earth. 
and so many who are lost and without Christ. I really thank God for laying his hands upon me. That makes me special. Tell your neighbor, that makes me special. Amen. Notice again what Paul says uh, in Romans chapter 13 that shows us very clearly this call is an urgent call. Romans chapter 13. And um, we are looking at verses 11 to 14. Paul said there, and do this knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. It was some 46 years ago the Lord laid his hands upon me. I was still in my teens. And when back then, you know, the, 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 the preaching and teaching me, we, we got a lot back then, emphasized a lot the imminent return of the Lord. And, and we were so living with this consciousness and awareness of the coming of the Lord. Sometimes as young people used to say, you know, um, I don't know if it was in all churches, but I know the church I was in. Sometimes they used to say, as young people, you know, um, just one thing I want to do before the Lord come back, I want to get married first. <laughs> You know, young people uh, tend to have this, you know. But, but that was, the, 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 you know, the consciousness. We, we, we really felt what I want to say today, today, now, this moment in time has brought us closer than when I first believed and than when you first came to faith in Christ. Is somebody understanding me? Every uh, time the clock strikes, it brings us closer and closer and closer to the coming of the Lord. So he said, hear what is happening. The night is fast spent. In other words, the close of the age. We are now at the close of the age. The night is fast spent. The days are Therefore, cast off the works of darkness. And let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day. Not in revelry and drunkenness. You know, people who only live for the good times. Not in lewdness and lust. Sexual immorality and perversion is very rampant today. So we, we should not be living that kind of lifestyle. Not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's something you've got to do. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. See? Again, the call to purity in the light of the imminent return. And just one final portion of scripture on this point. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. And we will see there in verses 12 and 13, uh, the Apostle Paul telling us, May the Lord make you abound, or rather increase and abound in love to one another and to all just as we do to you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at, notice again, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Let's drop down to verse 3 in the following chapter. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion, of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. That no one should take advantage and defraud his brother in this matter because the Lord is the avenger of all such. As we also forewarned you and testify, for God did not call us unto uncleanness, but in holiness. Notice all these things, the call to purity, purity of life and consecration unto God and holiness. It's always in the light of the imminent return to the Lord. But I want you to know that it's not only an urgent call, it's a universal call. A universal call. In other words, it's a call that goes out to every believer everywhere. To every child of God everywhere. In every county and every country. In every nation and every nationality. In every denomination and every congregation. In every pulpit and in every pew. The call is to purity. Say purity. The call to purity is universal. 
Notice what the Apostle John said in verse 3 again of our text, chapter 3. And everyone, tell your neighbor everyone means everyone. And tell them everyone means everyone everywhere. <laughs> Who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. You got to do it for yourself, you know. Your pastor could preach up a storm here on Sunday morning. You could respond to an altar call. You could cry and weep at the altar. But you see when you leave these four walls? You have your part to play. There may be some stuff you need to put aside. There may be some stuff you need to get rid of. There may be some relationships you've got to cut off. There may be some forms of entertainment you would have to stop enjoying and indulging in. Is somebody understanding me? In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and um, verse 19, we see there again the Apostle Paul telling us, Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having the seal, the Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. You call yourself a Christian? Depart from iniquity. But in a great house, they are not only vessels of gold and silver, but of wood and clay, some for the honor and dishonors. Uh, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Flee also youthful lust, pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace with all those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Say pure heart. But I want us to understand, it doesn't mean because we don't see like in Old Testament times when certain folk lives were not lying in up with the word of God and the standards of their call that uh, we, we didn't, you know, we would see people falling and dropping dead and judgment falling and all. It means that God is any less holy. And that his, his, his standards have dropped. There are many people who want to be involved in the work of God today. They want to be, you know, um, in ministry, various forms of ministry. They're not always behind a pulpit preaching the word, but various forms of ministry. Whether it is dance, whether it is worship, whether it is music, whether it is drama, whatever it is. We want you to understand According to the word of God here, if you're, if you're going to be a vessel of honor, a vessel that honors and glorifies God, upon which he can pour out his anointing, you must keep yourself clean. You must anoint yourself. And you would notice many times, there are some people, they're very, very gifted and they minister, whether it is singing, whether it's whatever, dance, whatever. And yes, it came off good. You c their ministry came off flawless and faultless. If you want to compare it with uh, professional standards of the world. But it somehow doesn't minister. How many of you understand what I'm trying to say? Somebody else comes, they're less gifted. But their life is clean. The anointing is upon them. Now, this is not uh, a call for, for accepting mediocrity. I believe we should offer to God a more excellent sacrifice in whatever we do. But what I'm saying, if we're going to offer to God a more excellent sacrifice and upon which the fire of God will come down and consume, in other words, the anointing and power of God will flow, your hands got to be clean and your heart got to be pure. Is somebody getting the message today? Give the Lord a hand of appreciation today. Amen. We are exhorted in Hebrews 12 and verse 14 that we must pursue peace with all men and holiness. You know what pursue means? It means you're running after something. You're chasing after something as if you're trying to capture it. Like those who go out hunting, I understand in the original life, it carries the idea of like somebody is out there hunting and they're trying to capture something. 
I say, you, you, you got to chase off. You got to, like, you want to lay hold of something to capture it. Seize it. Never let it go. Peace with all men. But notice what it also says. And holiness. Purity of life. Without which no man shall see the Lord. You want to see God? You want to see the Lord when he appears? When he returns? I don't know about you. I love to sing some of those old songs where it says, you know, we shall see Jesus and I, I, I want to see him. Look upon his face and all these things. You know, in First Peter chapter 1, we are told uh, concerning Jesus, whom having not seen, he love. Whom having not seen, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. You're receiving at the end of your faith the salvation of your soul. I am saying, my God, if I have never actually beheld Jesus with my eyes as yet. I know maybe some of you got visions and dreams. For whatever reason, the Lord hasn't favored me with those kinds of supernatural experiences, I would say, as yet. I don't know because the word of God says, in the old, you know, the old men in these last days shall dream dreams. So I'm in the old, old man stage now, right? I'm 60 plus. I'm considered senior citizen. A couple of years back, uh, you know, every time I go in the bank, are you age 55? I said, no, and I'm not hurry to get there. But every time I got there, I start taking advantage. Put me on the, the what? I forget whatever it is they call it in. Huh? Whatever it is, 55 plus with RBC, right? And then I, I, I was able to take advantage of T-TAP. So when I go, uh, I just show the card and I get in, but there's a mingy 3%, 5% or whatever. I'm taking it anyhow. <laughs> but, 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 but the thing is this, you know, um, if serving the Lord is so sweet, 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 sweet. I can experience such ecstatic joy. I can have the highest, I can experience the highest high that no coke could give me. And I come back down and I still have my head. Could you still imagine what it will be like when we act Actually, oh Lord have mercy. I don't know about you, but rivers of I tell you the tears will just flow. Just flow. Finally, at last, I'm beholding the king in all of his glory and all of his majesty and all of his beauty. I want to see him. And I'm telling you this, nothing in this world or no one in this world can come anywhere close to make me give up. My hope, is, are you hearing me somebody? My blessed hope that one day I shall see him. I shall see him. But I've got to move on because I know we work in with restricted time. It's an urgent call, a universal call. Finally, it's an uncompromising call. An uncompromising call. This means this is a call from the throne room of God from which there is no compromise, no concession, no retreat. Let me repeat that. This is a call from the throne room of God from which there is no compromise or will there will be no compromise, no concession, and no retreat. You see, if there is one thing the 21st century church need to understand and always remember, it is this. God is not going to make any compromises with his call to purity. Let me repeat that. God is not going to make any compromises with his call to purity. He is not going to make any concessions on his standards of holiness. And he is not going to retreat from any of his calls or commands to his people to live clean, pure, holy, and sanctified lives. In other words, he is not going to adjust his standards to please us. We are the ones who will have to adjust our standards to please him. Is somebody here in this house? You know, sometimes you hear people say, no, that was old time, that was long time, and, and whatever. 
The Lord says, I am the Lord and I change us not. God is holy. He has always been holy and he will continue to be holy. In 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 14 to 16 we are told, as obedient children, do not conform yourselves to your former lusts as in your ignorance. So in other words, don't live the lifestyle you lived before you came to know the Lord. You didn't know better than I. Listen, let me tell you something. I have no problems with the people out there in the world and how they live, you know. I shake my head. Sometimes I wonder. But then I understand they are in darkness. The Bible says, and the God of this world has blinded their eyes. They don't know better. They go according to the principles by which this world operates. They don't know better. But you see us, we have no excuse. We have the word of God to guide us. We have faithful preachers who declare the word of the Lord unto us. We have the Holy Ghost to convict us when we're getting off track. How many of you know what I'm talking about? If you don't feel that fluttering, you don't feel that thing, your heart going boop, 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 boop. When you're going in the wrong direction, you may need to do as the Apostle Paul said. Examine yourself. Are you really in the faith? In other words, are you really saved? Or have you strayed so far from God? That you are no longer sensitive to the work of the Holy Spirit to keep us on the right track. And by extension, we may keep ourselves pure. So as he who called you, the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, transferred you into the kingdom of his dear son, as he is holy, you also be holy. Now, the old version says in all, uh, in, in all conversation. Again, literally, that means their manner of life, your lifestyle, your conduct. You understand that? It doesn't just mean speech. It means more than that. It means your whole lifestyle, how you live when you leave the four walls of the church. There's somebody here in the house of God. You see, your faith is not just for inside of here. Your faith is needed much more out there. And I should, you know, even before I go on to what verse 16 says, Jesus said, you've got to let your light shine before men. The world is in darkness. They've got to see the light of life in and through you. Can I get a witness in the house? Because as it is written, be holy, because I am holy. When we go over to Ephesians 5, verses uh, 3, to five, it tells us there, yeah, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather given of thanks. Why? For this you know, that no fornicator, or unclean person, a covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Now notice what verse 6 says. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. In other words, those who, those who have been disobedient to the word of God. One of the things we have to guard against even as believers, is people are going to tell you, look, nothing wrong with this. If two people love one another, da da da, tra la la, and that was so and so time. And I, I said those things before. Le you know why I, I, we need to know this here? Le let, me, let me tell you something. It was about three or four years ago I read an article in the Newsday. Well, actually, a letter to the editor. In it, a young woman poured her heart out. She was a Christian young woman. And she was, you know, she wrote in despair how, as a Christian young woman, she was trying to keep herself pure until she married. And, you know, the number of relationships, even before she came to faith in Christ and after she, she said, you know what? Even in the church, the young men 
They want to get physical. They want to get physical all the way. You know what I'm trying to say? And, 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 and they, 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 they think. And I have met, I noticed the last couple of meeting, you know, the young ladies will come to me and they are telling me, these so-called born-again Christian young men who baptize and in the church. Not in this church, thank God. The kind of pastor you have here, you'll get convicted. I don't know. I said, I, and some of these young men are involved in ministry and all this kind of thing. And pastor, you only pestering me. You only, that is every time, every time. He wants you know what? And so the pressure is there. Now, I, I know we have another problem now. I noticed it more than 15, 20 years ago. In my time, it was the guys who used to push move behind women, but now it's the women, they're pushing the move. That's the next story. So I know it goes both ways, but the men don't seem to complain to me, is the, the women. <laughs> so, you know, I was thinking about this thing, and I, I, I came across a couple quotes here. And, and let me say this. Ladies, if you ever have such an encounter and experience, remember, Mr. Wrong will compromise your purity, then disappear. Mr. Right will protect your purity and then change your last name. Let me repeat it if you're writing it fast. Mr. Wrong will compromise your purity, then disappear. Mr. Right will protect your purity and then change your name. Give the Lord a hand of appreciation in the house of God. And I want to say, look, let's be real. We know a lot of stuff we did before we came to faith in Christ. And I want to be honest. Let's be honest. Could we be real here? I don't know how many, but I know many. <laughs> Even in the church, after they came to faith in Christ in their walk with the Lord. They have stumbled. They have fell in time. But you know what? I like this other quote. Your purity is worth fighting for. It's never too late to live a life of purity. Because if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hallelujah. And if you walk in the light as he's in the light, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us. Give the Lord another hand of appreciation. So we are not here to judge and condemn today. But we want to appeal to you. We want to exhort you. We want to encourage you to heed the call to purity. Amen? Because Jesus is coming soon. And we want to be ready and prepared when he comes. So let me just leave a couple of other closing uh, portions of scripture. Uh, and we really close off with this now. Uh, Revelation 21. And verses 1 to 3, we saw where the Apostle John, through the visions he was given, he said, I saw a new heaven and new earth. So this is how the, the, the final heaven and the final earth will be like. For the first earth, first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle or the dwelling of God is with men, and he shall dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Now, uh, let's jump down now to verses 7 and 8. But he who overcomes, the one who overcomes by the grace and power of God, who determines in his heart, look, you know what? I'm not going to go with the flow of the world and what is prevalent in, in many of our churches today. I am going to keep myself pure. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. What things? The things mentioned here before. Being actually in the presence of God. Where there's no more sickness. No more pain. No more death. Is somebody still with me? No more sorrow. No more crying. And you're actually in the presence of God. Imagine there will be no need for the moon or the sun. Because the glory of the Lord will be the light of that place. 
And when you read the, these last two chapters, you're reading about pearly gates and all this kind of stuff, streets of gold. And, but to me, what will make heaven heaven is really Jesus, eh? Right? You could show me all those stuff. If I don't see the face of Jesus, I haven't arrived in heaven as yet. <laughs> He said, he will inherit all these things and I'll be his God and he shall be my son. But the cowardly, notice, or the fearful, those who are afraid, afraid to take a stand for the Lord Jesus Christ. Stand up and stand out for him. The unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral. And we don't have to interpret that. Do you know what that's supposed to mean? The sorcerers, all those who indulge in obi and witchcraft. The idolaters and all that shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Then uh, verse 27, again, there shall by no means enter anything that defiles or causing an abomination or a lie, but only those whose names are written in the book of life. So if your name is written in the book of life, you wouldn't do anything that will defile you. And God is not going to allow anything there to defile heaven again. We know sin began in heaven. That's where it began with Lucifer, who is now Satan. We, we know what happened. And you see how God dealt with that. Kicked him out, one third of the angels with him. So heaven has been defiled from sin, by, by sin. The earth has been defiled by sin. But you say, God, that new heaven, that new earth. Say, none of that. None of that this time around. Nothing shall enter that defiles. And uh, let's look at um, verse 11 in chapter 20, and I close off with this. It says, he who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. Let him who is holy, be holy still. I'll be honest with you. Eh? Um, I am thankful to God for the time at which he laid his hands upon me. And I could understand why, because I, I tell you this, things that young people especially, I, I want to more deal with the younger people. The things they have to deal and contend with. We didn't have to deal with, contend with those things when I got saved. To me, it's, it, 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 you know, um, and I realize this is why we need the Spirit of God. This is why God said, I will have to pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Because the kind of music they are exposed to, the movies, all the madness out there. You know, young people, they are very much, they're, that, you know, there's that strong attraction and appeal. There will be a constant battle. One of the things, and I know your pastor would have mentioned it, you know, we have to contend with a lot these days. We, I, we didn't have to deal with these issues when I got saved about who is transgender and, 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 and all this guy and, and homosexual and all. I mean, up to last night, I'm reading in, uh, on the Yahoo News where some uh, family is taking some private school in the United States to court because uh, it's a boy child they have, but he feels he's a, he's a girl. And so he must be treated like a transgender child and, and he must be able to go into the, the, the girl's, um, you know, bathroom and all this kind of stuff. And we didn't have to deal and contend with these things, you know. And when people like us stand up and we are saying, look, you know, this is what the word of God says. We, we, we are looked upon as being bigoted, narrow-minded and haters. Look at how the tables have turned. So light has now become darkness, and darkness light. So people are now calling wrong right, and right is now wrong. That is why, you know, we have this, when sin abound, grace, and, and, and the Lord, you know, there's that portion of scripture says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, and man, there's a flood tide of iniquity upon the earth. I want to say to you young people, get close to God. Is somebody here in Get close. Take your relationship with God seriously. This is no time to be playing fun and games. This is no time to have one foot in the church and one foot in the world. 
You can't serve two masters. You can't have the cross of the Savior in one hand and the pitchfork of the devil in the other hand. Is somebody here in me in the house of God? Jesus said you got to, is either you hate one master or this, and love the other. You, 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 you are loyal to one and despise that. You got to make up your mind. Because let me tell you, Satan, this is all out warfare we are in in these end times. He's not playing games. And I tell you, it's a dangerous thing now to stray and not to remain covered under the blood of Jesus. All you have to do is every day read the tragedies that are taking place. And, and, and you know, I want to say this too. Let me just say this. Because sometimes preachers like us are not so popular these days. Everybody wants to help God, want to bless them. And they want a prophet, you know, I was going to say prophet life, you know, prophecy and, and this kind of thing. And, and all of that. And how you'll have a mansion and you'll have the most handsome husband, the most beautiful wife. I know that's preachers like us are considered real old fashioned and, and not with it and all of that. But I'll tell you this. If I could scare the hell out of you, I will scare the hell out of you. Because it's appointed unto men wants to die. After this. No second chance. People could cry on a buckets of tears at the altar. If you didn't die in faith, in purity, in your walk with God, no pastor, no priest, no, pope, no pundit could pray your soul out of hell into heaven. Is somebody here in me in the house of God? Jesus is coming soon. And young people, I'll tell you something. You are the primary target of the enemy. I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. The Bible says God calls the young because they are strong. There's so much you can do for God. You, you, they, you know, God can use in such mighty and awesome. That's why you are primary target of the enemy. Notice the, the entertainers out there in the world. It's mostly young people. The one who drawing all the crowds and driving them wild and crazy and joining the Illuminati and who in lodge and all this. It's young people. Oh, you got a lot of old people too. Pastor, just bear with me. Let me just close off this little thing here. I remembered something my, my, uh, uh, my, my, my pastor used to say to me. And... Yeah, 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 you know, um, he said it's in our church and, and it, it has never left me. And, and this is not to disregard the older people or anything of the sort or depreciate them. But he said, you know what? When an old person gets saved, all God gets is a soul, generally speaking. Most of the time they commit all kinds of infirmities. <laughs> Uncle Arthur is the friend. You understand what I'm trying to say? They don't have the energy. They don't have the drive as they you had before. You know what I mean? They're suffering mental decline. They're on all kinds of pills, and they must eat at a certain time and all of that. Right? Unless they were doing like me, you know, you're, you, I have my own gym at home. Right? I watch what I eat. I take my vitamins, right? But I know they're still going downhill. You understand what I'm trying to say? I know one day I will still expire and give up the ghost like everybody else. But I want to say this. That's how it is generally. Let's be real. So we're not deep. But you say, you see, when God gets a young person, he gets more than a soul. He gets a whole life. Did somebody hear me? He gets a whole life that can be used in his service and for his honor and for his glory. Let me tell you, the, the disciples were young people and they were old fogies with gray hair, you know. Yes, they lived, and some of them, you know, but, but, but generally all of them were in their youthful days. And I don't know why in this message the Lord is just seemingly having me say, young people, take your walk with God serious. Learn to get up early. Spend time with God. Spend time in the Word. Learn to call about. Learn to, to know your God. Let them fill you and anoint you and use you. Because young people are the best people to reach other young people. Give the Lord another hand of appreciation. Could we all stand?